to avoid the protein. Sure. <laughs> yeah, the protein of the future. That's, that's right. Good saying. evening, everyone. My name is Pat Kowitzel. I'm the buyer and author program coordinator at Magic City Books, and I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. We are really excited to be welcoming uh, Rose Eveleth and a number of graphic artists tonight for a, a celebration of their new collaborative book, Flash Forward, and we're going to learn a lot more about that as we go along. Um, if this is the first time you're joining us for one of our author programs, welcome. We do these just about uh, every week, two or three times a week at almost always at seven o'clock. We've got a couple more lined up later this week, a bunch coming up in May, um, and, and try to have kind of a wide variety of programming. We do, you know, fiction, nonfiction, some kids books, um, you know, sometimes pretty heavy topics and, and, and part of the, you know, kind of larger conversation that's going on in the world. And sometimes we get to take a diversion from that and have a lot of fun as well. So um, we have a YouTube channel with a lot of our past programs scheduled or up there and you can watch those. Uh, everything from, you know, poetry readings to Matthew McConaughey and conversation with Woody Harrelson. Uh, Rachel Maddow joined us last fall. John Gerson's Grisham has joined us. We've just, we've got a lot of, of things out there. Um, we have one more uh, graphic novel program scheduled uh, on the schedule right now, and that is going to be coming up in May with um, Alvern Ball and Stacey Robinson. Their book also out through Abrams, same as Flash Forward. Um, their book is called Across the Tracks, and it's a graphic novel set up uh, are in and around the events of the Tulsa Race Massacre in 1921. And so uh, something that we're really excited to be presenting um, that program coming up May 20th, I believe it's a, it's a third, yeah, May, Thursday, May 20th. So um, you can check out all of those upcoming programs at magiccitybooks.com. Tonight, uh, we will be putting links to purchase Flash Forward by Rose and, and her team of graphic artists that, that worked on this book. We'll be putting links in the chat. You can also uh, visit us at Magic City Books in downtown Tulsa to be able to pick up a copy. Um, we will also invite your questions. If you have questions for Rose or any of the artists tonight, please, if you're joining us on Zoom, post it in the Q&A. If you're watching this on Facebook, then uh, just put it in the comments section and we will be able to bring those over and answer as many as time allows tonight. So uh, we'll, be, we'll get going there. We are really excited about uh, this, this program because it is so collaborative and we're gonna be able to see some of the art and, and talk to artists and, and the author and, and be able to do so much here. And I'm gonna, give a, a little introduction to Rose, and then Rose is gonna uh, introduce our artists for tonight. But Rose Eveleth is a producer, host, reporter, and writer, a producer of, and host of the hit podcast, Flash Forward, and a producer of ESPN's award-winning 30 for 30 podcast. Her work has been featured in numerous publications, including Atlantic, Smithsonian Magazine, New York Times, Scientific American, and the Best American Science Writing Anthology. Uh, her new book, Flash Forward, just came out recently, and it is, uh, brought to life by 12 of the most imaginative comics and graphic artists at work, including uh, Sophie Goldstein, uh, Blue Delaquanti, and Amelia Honorato, excuse me, I hope I got those right. And, uh, and they will, they, those three are joining us tonight. Thank you all very much for joining us. Enjoy the program, and I'm going to hand it off to Rose. Thanks, Rose. Thank you so much for having us. I am super excited. This is the first event for the book, so it's like Big and exciting. Um, it's also my first ever book thing, uh, unlike these veterans that we were talking to who have like done a ton of printed stuff. Um, so I was saying before, like when it came in the mail, I make a podcast, which is just like sounds in the ether. And so like having a physical object to touch <laughs> is incredible. Um, and I am so thankful that the artists involved in the book played along and sort of created these amazing comics. And I'm really excited to talk to a couple of them tonight with you. Um, Yes, we are gonna do, so unlike um, some events, I'm not gonna like reserve a ton of time at the end for questions like in a separate section. So feel free to ask as we go and I will keep an eye on it and we'll kind of wrap those into the programming. Um, uh, that makes it sound like we have a whole song and dance plan for you. It's, we're just gonna talk. <laughs> um, but uh, so feel free to, yeah, put the chat, don't like wait for some sort of like prompt. If you have a question, just sort of fire it off and we'll, we'll be there. Um, I want to introduce three amazing people that were, are here uh, who 
each contributed something absolutely incredible to the book. Um, Sophie Goldstein um, is an award-winning graphic novelist, illustrator, editor, and comics instructor living in Tulsa, which is how we are here at Magic City, and I'm very, very thankful for that. Um, she is a 2019-2020 Tulsa Artist Fellow, also a core faculty member at Lesley University's Low Residency Creative Writing MFA in Graphic Novels and Comics. Um, she has a ton of incredible uh, graphic novels that you can literally just go purchase now and absolutely should. Um, they're like so fun and delightful, um, including uh, House of Women, The Oven, and Embarrassment of Witches, which is my favorite. Uh, <laughs> and um, all of those are just like amazing and just like don't sleep on any of this. Um, we will try to make sure that links to all of everybody's work is put into the chat. Um, and at the end of this, I will also make sure that everybody, all the artists have time to talk a little bit about like what they're up to and where they could, we could find them. But um, at the very least, do a Google of all these people. Um, we also have Blue Delaquanti, who um, is a comic artist and writer based in Minneapolis. Um, they are the creator of the science fiction comic, Oh Human Star, which has been serialized online since 2012. Is that correct? That's right. Like an eternity in internet years. <laughs> um, <laughs> coming, up on, coming up on 10 years next year, which is like a lot. Um, also, it like maintains delight across the entire history of, of the comic. Um, incredibly great. Uh, also the co-creator of the graphic novel Meal with uh, the amazing food writer Soleil Ho um, and just like incredible work. Um, I should say Sophie wrote the Popnonymous story, made the Popnonymous story in the book and Blue worked on the Bye Bye Binary comic with uh, Ziad Ayub um, and we'll talk more about all of these comics in a second. Um, and last but of course not least, uh, Amelia Onorato um, who contributed the Under the Sea uh, comic in the book, a 2012 graduate from the Center for Cartoon Studies. Um, I love the bio that you gave, which is like originally from a tiny fishing village, too small to have its own zip code. And um, I actually weirdly have a large number of friends who are similarly from tiny fishing villages that are too small for their own business <laughs> zip code. I think there's like a certain personality that I am drawn to that like is from these like some weird places. Um, Amelia currently lives in Rhode Island and has a black cat named Mew Jean, is that correct? <laughs> That is correct. Eugene. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, really good. Really good. Um, so I want to talk a little bit very briefly about sort of like the book and sort of what to expect if you're coming to this. I'm assuming that if you're here, you probably have a sense of like who, what the show is, maybe who some of these books are. But the book is an adaptation of the podcast that I make about the future. And for many years, um, I think any time you have a podcast that like surpasses some invisible threshold of popularity, you suddenly get all these emails from people being like, when are you going to do a book? Um, or like, what's, when's the, what's the spinoff, right? What's the like cross-platform business play? And so I'd been getting these emails for a long time. And I remember just being like, I don't know how I would do a book that would be satisfying. The podcast does this thing where it mixes audio fiction and journalism. And I didn't want to make something that was just like, the transcripts of the episodes written into long form like I wouldn't buy that if I were a listener of the show like I don't know I couldn't think of anything um and then I got an email from a one Sophie Goldstein who was like hey uh what about comics like have you ever thought of doing comics and I had not ever thought of doing comics but it was like an immediate light bulb like oh yes like this is such a good idea so I want to start actually by throwing to Sophie and asking like why you thought of this format, like why you thought this would be a good fit, like what about Flash Forward spoke to you, RE Comics? Well, so, you know, it was a listener to the, of the show and, and I love those little skits that you open with. Um, and each, it's like almost exactly like a, a writing prompt, like each episode is like, it's, but it's better because not only do you have this key, this like kernel of an idea, but then you have all this like science and research and you talk to science fiction writers and stuff to back it up. And it's just so like natural to me to like take that and be like, okay, like now you have the research, which is often the hard part of science fiction to like go and make a story. So, um, so the idea of like turning it into comics um, just seemed like really natural and I was just like very jazzed about it um I was <laughs> when I first emailed you I was envisioning like a zine um not so certainly not something as like awesome as this book but I'm like but of course like this is even better and it was so cool to be able to 
come on board with it and also like bring on a bunch of my favorite cartoonists to do their stories and like help them um you know develop them and like I just like see what they did because people you know it's interesting to see how people take each premise and like give it their own particular flavor um and just take it in directions that you would never expect like that's that's so cool and what part of what I love about editing yeah it was such a fun process for me being like a total like noob and to, to like comics like I've never I mean I like read them but I had never thought about doing anything like that um and uh Sophie and Matt Lubchansky who sort of co-edited this with me were incredibly patient with my like very naive questions <laughs> about like how any of this works like <laughs> what are the stages of making like I just had no like absolutely no idea um and also really helpful in in finding incredible artists who you know you can see in the book and I, I would also say that it was an incredibly satisfying process because flash forward for the, a really long time was just me. Like there was literally no one else who worked on the show. It was like weird stuff that came out of my brain. Last year, I was able to hire an amazing producer, Julia Linus Goodman, who's great. Um, but for the longest time, it was just like me and me and the dog, <laughs> like, you know? And so getting to collaborate with other people to Sophie's point was incredible because it's true. Like there were episodes where I thought like, okay, this is kind of what this episode is about. And then we would talk to the artists and they would come back with a pitch for an idea for a comic where I'd be like, wow, I would never have thought of that. Like that is not a thing that I would have like encountered. Um, one example is the um, the Don't Lie to Me chapter that Box Brown did, um, which like is about lie detectors and this idea of like, what if you had a lie detector all the time? Um, and, you know, in the original episode in the way that I was thinking about it, it was really about like, you know, li white lies that you tell and like, you actually really want to know the truth all the time and all this stuff. And Box introduced this really incredible sort of like complication to that, which is comes from his own experiences of like negative self-talk. And if you had a box that actually could beep every time you say like, I'm the worst. And it was like, no, you're not. Like that would be <laughs> great. And like, I would, I would never have come up with that, right? Like that is such a thing that comes from someone's personal experience. And there's stuff like that, I think in every comic where people bring their own perspective to it um, and bring their own kind of like vibe to the comic in ways that was so cool. <laughs> like, you know, for me to kind of like get to experience. Um, so I, I really, really appreciate that. Um, so we have some slides from each of these comics that I kind of want to open up if we can and have folks just talk a little bit about each one. Um, and I have a couple, you know, I'll have some questions for folks around um, what it was like and to make them and all that stuff and what drew you to them. Um, so I think, and I made, so I'm going to be very nerdy. Uh, so to Sophie's point, like I am the kind of person who like, if there is something to do, I will only, I will do it in the most like try hard extreme way. So it's like, we're not doing a zine. We're doing like a hardcover book that like, <laughs> like, you know, I, like I just like can't not do that. So in that spirit, I made custom zoom backgrounds for each of these so that I could have them. So, uh, here's, I'm going to rotate through them as we go through. Um, so, uh, the first comic that I think we're going to talk about in the, um, in, on our little slides here is blues. I yeah. Think. I was going to say yes. that looks like Zied's art there. Yeah, there we go. Yes. So I guess first thing I'd love to know from you is, you know, in the process of making this, the way that, um, we figured out who was going to do what chapter and like how we were going to pick the topics was every artist got a list of all the flash forward episodes, which is over a hundred episodes, which is like a bit daunting, I'm sure when you like open it and you're like, ah, <laughs> like, you know, um, but, and then folks were asked to kind of pick their favorite three, I think it was. And then we kind of balanced across the book for like near future, far future, positive, negative, all that stuff. Um, so before we talk a little bit about the actual sort of comic, I'd love to know what drew you blue to like this particular topic or this idea or like why this one? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll be honest, like this is one where uh, you reached out to me, I think near the beginning of like thinking of the project or if the when the project was just like starting to be a twinkle in your eye, you're like, well, here's some existing, you know, episodes that we have. I looked over the list and I saw the one for Bye Bye Binary and I was like, I want this one. Please let me have this one. <laughs> just, I'll pick my two others, but I, my heart is in this one. And um, 
the topic is one that I have explored in my other work before. I find that I'm really drawn to it. I like when it appears in science fiction. Um, the I feel like I am kind of a like uh, I'm inspired by uh, Ursula Le Guin, uh, Anne Lecky, Ian Banks, like that kind of school of pro science fiction, and where you know they're often like big, grand, sweeping space operas, but they always focus on like the social implications of like cultures where maybe gender is fluid or you know there's no concept of like personal property like things that have like things that affect how people interact with each other I always love that in science fiction so that tends to factor into what I write so when I saw that that's like a what if which in this case is like what would it be like if you know gender was fluid as like a social cultural medical concept so I really wanted to explore what that could look like in a, you know, a personal story where it was like, you know, the water everyone swims in, but there's very much like a personal drama happening at the center of it all. One of the things that you did such a good job of with Zied, who did the art um, and just like beautiful, I love the style and like the colors and it just feels so vibrant in a way that like is really, really lovely. Um, one of the challenges that you had that I think you and Zia actually navigated really well is like certain things are actually kind of hard to show sometimes that are like more cultural, right? Like, and this happens is, you know, I encounter this with Flash Forward where in the intro scenes, I have to think about like, how do I kind of like make explicit like what we're talking about, you know, like in the, <laughs> in the episode um, without someone literally being like, ah, uh, yes, and now gender is, you know, like, you know, like there's sort of like that weird moment of exposition. Um, and when it's a tech thing, you can just show the tech thing and just be like, here's the device, right? Here's the thing. Mm -hmm. With this, it's a little harder to kind of like show people the world that we're in and how it's different from what we have now. And I, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about like how you thought about showing that in, in this where like there's some iconic like pointers in the, um, in the, in the chapter that I think like do that work really well and I'd love to hear you like how did you think about trying to show something like a cultural change yeah absolutely I mean the first thing I want to point out is that um the art for the story is done by Ziad Ayub who he's awesome he's a Tunisian um comic artist who I believe is currently based in France I have been really into his work for a long time he does lots of really interesting work about uh queer and trans men um focusing on like North African cultures, which I found was something I wasn't super familiar with before I got to know his work. I was really into it when I reached out to him because I'd wanted to work with him on something. And I was like, I want to do this book with you. It's about like, you know, a trans divorced young dad. I kind of would like to have his him have a family, like a Tunisian like family. Do you, could you work with me on that? And he was like, absolutely. Yes. So there was lots of like, in like there was lots of ways that Ziad informed like how things look and like what the family dynamic is and like what the family home is like that are you know visual as you say and they kind of inform how all these characters engage with each other um and then in other ways like I, the, the notes that I gave him when I was like writing the script about kind of what I wanted these characters to be like which you know I, I gave kind of a brief overview but it's like about uh divorced dad who's kind of reconnecting with a childhood best friend he's like expecting his second kid with the twist being that he's the one pregnant with it and so I kind of gave Zia this brief kind of about who these main who these two guys were and you know they like are both dudes now but they like grew up together transitioned together throughout their lives so I was like all right this one guy he's a sneaker head he loves collecting shoes he always, he's a little schlubby. He was never super fashionable when they were both like young women. He kind of had like a Tracy Chapman kind of like vibe. And then the other one, very fashionable, very slick, would wear Supreme and like bandage dresses. Like that's the kind of look. And he's like, I got you. So <laughs> I don't know. Like he, he was very good about those like things that kind of like really gave a great immediate visual impression of like who these characters were, what their priorities were. And like the result is just gorgeous. And I feel like it's so efficient, like it's such economical storytelling for something that could be kind of an esoteric concept if you're not immersed in like queer comics 24 seven the way I am. So like, I really appreciated how accessible, like as a team we were able to make it, I think. 
-hmm. Yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit about like that teamwork, right? Because like there are two chapters in the book that feature teams, this one and then the one um, about deep fakes, which are two people who've actually worked together a lot before and so like know each other quite well um, and kind of like share, I think, a, a language in the way that you do when you have someone you've worked with a lot over many years. But this, you mentioned, was like your first time working together. Like what was that? I mean, you talked a little bit about it, but like what was that process like? Um, I'm trying to remember that process now. I feel like that was like before quarantine. So I was like, I'm yeah. going back to like, what was my life then? Yeah. Um, I mean, like I said, I had like talked with him about this idea of like what the family dynamic would be. I'd done some research on my own. So early on, there was like some back and forth about how characters would speak, especially the parents and kind of like, you know, what the like, there's like a, a family scene where there's lots of like characters moving around. So a lot of it's talking logistics, almost like you're you're staging a play. You kind of have to figure out where everybody is going to be in a scene so that it's readable, so that you are like keeping track of every, where everybody is at any given time. And like, there was like communication, like all the logistics stuff with comics is like, you know, in my head, I might envision a panel looking a certain way. And then almost always Zied has like a much better solution. It's like, oh, I was imagining it being drawn this way. And I'm like, yes, please do that instead. That's so much better. <laughs> that always works out. Feel like the artists that I work with when I write always have a better solution. But it's fun seeing how they interpret my scripts in a way that's different from what I pictured in my head. Yeah, and the, the outcome is so, it is like, for me as a learning curve in learning like how to think about comics which like this whole process has been um it, it is much more like plays than I think I maybe realized I hadn't given it a ton of thought to be totally honest but like it is like you even looking through drafts and trying to kind of learn how to read the visual language of like a draft of a comic which is like hard if you've never done it before yeah. um like learning to think of it that way where it's like okay this character is moving in this and I'm like following it and it was a really it was really fun to learn that from all of you um so thank you for the crash course in the <laughs> comics um, in many ways um was there anything that surprised you as you worked on this that like you didn't expect um let me think was there anything that surprised me um I feel like well, I, in a lot of ways, like the, I was trying to go off of information that I had learned about when it comes to like being pregnant, if you were, you know, a trans man or if you're gender nonconforming, or if you're, if you're working, if you've like testosterone in your system, basically the information I had at the time was that it's generally recommended that you should go off tea if you're pregnant. And now that, that information or that common wisdom is changing a bit. So I like that might even be obsolete now, which is hilarious, but <laughs> yeah, no, I, I feel like it was really interesting. I've never been pregnant myself. So I ended up like finding lots of uh, comics and like, you know, personal like journals of like what it's like to be pregnant. What does your, to your body? And it's, oh boy, it's really interesting. <laughs> Very much so. This this chapter is also interesting for me because this was one of the, in the list of flash forward episodes, this is one of the earliest episodes we did. Um, mm -hmm. it, like is in the first season of the show. Um, and the show's now been on for six years. And not only has the style of the show changed, but also like culture has changed around how we talk about gender. And then also like my personal feelings about gender have changed a lot. And so mm -hmm. it was interesting to revisit all of that. And I'm actually really glad as soon as you said you wanted to do this one, I was like, yes, this is yours. You can have it. Like, I'm excited about it because it was something that I had actually been thinking about revisiting on the show, because if I were to make that episode now, I would make it totally differently than I made it when it first came out. Mm -hmm. um, and like, so I'm really glad that I got the chance to like revisit the ideas in this format um, because it is like listening back on it. I mean, there's nothing in it where I'm like, oh God, <laughs> you know, but, um, but there are things where I'm like, oh yeah, I actually don't totally think that way anymore about some of these questions. And so it was a really, it was a, like very fun for me to kind of go through it again. Um, and we might actually do an episode this season that kind of like takes these ideas and revisits them in kind of like a, a new way on the podcast. For sure. Um, I mean, as you say, like, it's something that I think the, the, the conversation like publicly has changed a lot in the last like five or six years even. And I feel like that's, you know, it's because of like things that have happened like on a political like level that are, you know, like unsettling or, you know, are not necessarily 
positives, like they could be setbacks for the trans community, but I feel like the conversation has changed a lot. Like, I feel like, uh, like people who talk about trans issues have been very like smart and thoughtful about talking about how you tie it to trans rights to tie it to women's rights or healthcare or, you know, paternity leave, maternity leave, like all these things that people care about very much. And <laughs> being able to like tie those in is like, I think it has, it's one of those big changes that have happened. Yeah. And I want to do, I do want to shout out a podcast that I love about gender called Gender Reveal. If you are a person who listens to podcasts and have a curiosity around all things gender, it is a great podcast. Talk Woodstock is the host quoted in the chapter. Um, so uh, definitely check that out. Um, let's talk about underwater stuff. <laughs> um, so yay, Amelia. Um, <laughs> So I will say that this one is near and dear to my heart because I am obsessed with the ocean in a way like I wanted to be the Jane Goodall of the sea. I like learned about Jane Goodall. I was like, that's cool. And then I learned about scuba diving and I was like, oh yes, this will be my thing. I was 12 and I demanded that for my birthday, I got scuba certified and my parents had to like find someone who would scuba certified a 12 year old in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know? like, so, um, that was my life. I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Like before I went into journalism, I thought I would do like marine biology was going to be like my thing. I would live underwater in a heartbeat. So I was yes. really excited when you picked this one. Um, and so I'm very happy to talk to you about it. What drew you to under the sea ideas? So as we talked about in the intro to this event, um, I grew up in a small fishing village that didn't even have its own zip code. We share it with the, the next town over. Um, and so there um, were a lot of lobstermen that were still lobstering when I was a kid. Um, and it was at that point, a very kind of blue collar um, working class town like people who've been there for generations and generations and during my lifetime I've seen the change that happens where all of a sudden the property taxes are too high the original folks have to move out the rich people come in and it becomes basically a, a tourism um, centrality so um, I'm also conscious of the fact that you know the, the ocean is rising like you said at the end of uh, the essay at the end of the chapter, the ocean's not going to save us, it's coming for us. And it's, it's true. <laughs> um, and I've just been around the ocean my whole life. I, similar to you, um, have been fascinated by marine biology. There's a program in New London, Connecticut, which was part of our um, school area, where called Project Oceanography. And so once a year, you'd get to do a field trip where you get to go on a trawler fishing vessel and put the net down, pull up a bunch of stuff, uh, do a, a core with the mud. And it's like so cool. And I don't know, it's just always fascinated me. Yeah. Yeah, this is, um, I have, I made my Zoom, different Zoom backgrounds. This is my favorite scene, I think, from the chapter, which is full of just like lovely little moments. But this one, I'm going to just disappear for a second. This one where they're in underwater <laughs> Venice and they're taking a photo of like being in, I just love like the, all of actually, all of the chapters are full of these little visual like gags and little visual like Easter eggs. And Catherine actually asked a question that I will come back to. So start thinking about this now, all of you, which is your favorite Easter egg that made it into the book in like any of these comics. There is one in Sophie's that makes me laugh literally every time I see it. <laughs> one of the like, like signs in the background. So think about that. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, but you, you took underwater and I love that you, you wrote a meet cute, right? Like it, yeah. in under, in underwater land, like talk to me about that. So um, the story that, my chapter about under is ostensibly about under the sea is uh, Mosey, who is the gentleman holding the little um, permit that he's allowed to skip the the customs line and go straight into underwater Venice to deliver some fish to a very attractive chef lady. Um, it is essentially about you know people who work uh, so. Sorry, I'm very excited trying to condense all of my words. 
I actually ended up combining two episodes from Flash Forward because although it's mostly under the sea, it also involved your aquaculture episode. So Mosey works in an aquaculture environment that is sustainably harvesting oysters and red snapper um, after sea rise has caused different, you know, fish to become unsustainable. And so he gets this rush order that has to be taken down to Venice, which has become the sunken city. It's no longer the floating city. Um, at some point, someone was able to turn it into an underwater amusement park, essentially. So tourists are still able to come, um, but there's a lot more difficulty in getting there, especially like the decompression process, which would take probably 16 hours, according to the research notes that you let me look at, which was mind boggling to me, because that was for, I think, Sea Lab 2, which is only 150 feet down. Like, it's not that far. <laughs> it takes so long to be able to leave without dying horribly. Uh. Yeah, it was very fun to work with you on like sort of fact checking some of this and being like, okay, if you did have Venice underwater and you wanted like teenagers to be able to go there, like how do you yeah. like sort of like working on, like, through the like science field trips? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was very fun. And then you had some fun with the um the you have to breathe helium in a lot of mm -hmm. these situations. And so like the voices are very high. If you listen to the episode of Flash Forward, you actually can hear the voice like there's sort of a like the eagle has landed moment for underwater but it doesn't sound cool at all because it's literally yeah. like a helium voice person yeah. <laughs> like, which is like not badass in any way um but yes that was a, a fun one to work on in terms of like thinking through the the sort of sciencey side of it as you combined kind of these ideas um did anything surprise you uh aside from the helium voice <laughs> It was largely the science that surprised me because like, I, I'm not going to lie, I cut my sci-fi teeth on a bunch of, um, I would call delicious garbage, things like <laughs> Waterworld and Deep Blue Sea and uh, Sphere. And classics. Also, I believe the word you're yes. looking for is classics. <laughs> yes, cult classics, love them. Uh, but Lord knows they are not scientifically accurate. So all of them make it seem like, yeah, that's no big deal. You just go in the, you know, your underwater environment and everyone sounds fine. And ironically of all of them, I think Sphere's the only one that addresses the helium stuff, but they immediately say, oh, we gave you voice regulators. So you don't sound like that, but they do like a, a like Wizard of Oz little sing along at one point in the little helium chambers very strange so all of that was fascinating like how much it would cost how expensive it is to do is it um aquarius now was the one that you were researching during the podcast episode it's only the size of a school bus and it is astronomically expensive to maintain it um so like i had always envisioned like oh you know when all the land goes away the rich people will live on the small resource that remains and all us poor folks are going to get shoved into little bubbles underwater but no the opposite would be true <laughs> yes that is one of the things that i find really fascinating about the marine environment is that like it it's so hostile to people like we're not supposed to be there you know like in a very like real way um and there are people who there are a couple of guys who were both astronauts and aquanauts so they both went into space and went underwater and they said that it was much harder to go underwater like it was much more dangerous much scarier like you know there's just like it seems like space would be the, the scary thing and the hard thing but um the ocean is no joke like it's very very challenging to do that in a way that is safe um and the uh sadly the sea lab project did not get very much funding and so also part of the reason it was scary was because it was like sort of cobbled together yeah, <laughs> in ways they were like is this team. really safe <laughs> like you know, do i really want to be doing this um so that uh that is not encouraging when you like walk up to your like you know your ship and you're like hmm <laughs> pretty sure this was a scrap heap at some point um but um but yeah i love i love the like sweetness of the chapter i think that's like such a great balance because like some of the chapters are very dark right and are very like intense um and it's a nice kind of like not i want to say palette cleanser because that makes it sound like it's like fluffy in some way it's got yeah. lots of really cool ideas and science in it but it also is really sweet um and i think it's a nice kind of like 
I mean, I love it. I love a meet cute. And I would, again, like I would never have written that, right? Like that is not like the kind of, you know, and so it's a, another example of, you know, places that the book goes that I would not have come up with um, on my own. Um, should we talk about AI pop stars, which is Sophie's chapter, which I'm very excited about. Um, and I'm going to switch my Zoom background every time so that we have everybody. Um, so this whole book was your idea. You could have picked any episode and you would have had first dibs really. Like even if, sorry, Blue, but even if Sophie had been like, I want the gender <laughs> one, Sophie gets the gender one. Um, why this one? Why this chapter? Um, I think cause it's like, it's a mixed bag in terms of like positive and negative things. Like I always think with science fiction, it's very, um, it's very easy to go negative with technology and be like, okay, well, here are the things that will like, you know, like you change this one gene and then you have like giant mimic bugs who are coming to eat us. Um, and I, I just don't think that that like is the most interesting thing that you can do all the time. And so with pop stars, like, I think there's the obvious dystopian aspect of we're all like, oh, they're doing holograms of dead people. Like that seems like horrible, I hate that. Um, but on the other hand, and I don't know if readers get this from it, but I, I think like, you know, for me, it was interesting that you have this huge pop star, but then you can have iterations of a pop star that people could have a personal relationship with. Like you see the main character having, she has a relationship with her version of this pop star that she idolizes at the end. And she has a conversation with what is essentially an AI, but is an AI that resembles someone she really admires. So I think that um, even though there is stuff of the, like the overall tone of the chapter is not like, super light I thought that there is enough friction there to make it really interesting yeah and there is like so much joy in the illustrations of it like there's just so much like visual cool candy kind of like in each illustration that like even in the moments that are sad I just couldn't stop like looking at it. I was like this looks so good <laughs> um and it just looks really cool and it you've built out a very robust like world where like you've thought about advertising you've thought about like the train and there's just like these scenes where it does really feel like this is a 360 look at what this future could be like um in kind of like a technicolor very pop star way right like that pop stars are these like larger than life entities it's interesting I for me, when I you picked this, I was like, oh, that's cool. That'll be interesting. And then when I was writing the chapter, it was actually one of the ones where I was the most like, oh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that is really interesting in this. Like, you know, I knew I was interested in underground underwater stuff. I knew I was interested in some of these other ones. The pop star one, it's not like I was like, oh, no, I have to do it. I was excited about it. But I had forgotten just like how weird it can get and like how many like strange examples there are and like diving deep into the world of like Instagram influencers who are AI and just like <laughs> just so weird <laughs> in like this very satisfying way uh to me at least um to kind of like really think through like how different is it if it's an AI versus like a pop star who is basically managed by 10,000 people and like you know all of those questions um were fun I did go for the episode this is based on I did go to a Hatsune Miku concert who is a uh sort of like hologram uh pop star uh and it was incredibly effective i was like wow this was very fun i actually had a great time um i didn't know any of the songs and i don't speak japanese and they're all in japanese so i did not know what was going on largely but i did notice that the fans are very intense um and there was some, <laughs> there was some crying happening there was like people were so overcome with emotion that they were crying at this concert and i was like wow i mean what more can you ask for if you're a like musician, right? like or a pop star or whatever. Um, was there anything that you were not expecting that you found as you were like working on this or like something that was harder than you expected in trying to kind of like show this stuff? Um, well, I think there is some, it was just like navigating the difference between like real versus virtual space and what that looks like. I mean, I ended up doing something where I had like a half tone pattern that was an overlay on the parts of the, cause there's like a lot of like floating virtual images. And so to distinguish those from real, cause my style's cartoony. So maybe someone who drew more realistically could have like very realistic drawings and then very cartoony drawings. But since everything I do is cartoony, I need to like figure out a way to have both. 
Um, so that was kind of like an interesting thing to try and figure out. And then also to have these overlays. So like, um, so the reader could understand what was going on and people weren't just like, what is happening? Uh, so I think that part was, was the most challenging for me. Yeah. It's, it's very effective, I would say, in like sort of distinguishing where you're at in the, in the episode. And there's a really great moment where she like turns it all off that you it don't really does have that cinematic feeling where it's like, and then it all goes away. And she's just like in the actual real world, right? Like with the people on the train. Um, I mean, best I case love. scenario that when we get into that future, you can actually turn off advertising yeah. that is like projected into your, into your eyes or brains or whatever. Like we don't, I don't know if that's going to be uh, the actual case where the point where they can like, you know, have lasers that will project like images into your eyes that will follow you down the street or something like, are we going to be able to block that? Are we going to have to wear like full body suits that are like, what do you call those cages that like block yeah, out? Yeah, Faraday cages. Faraday yeah. cages, but like, you know, a hoodie. Um, Tinfoil hats, man, they're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> but they'll be so stylish. <laughs> supreme tinfoil hats <laughs> um I do so I I primed you for this question and Catherine had asked about favorite visual like easter eggs in your chapters so I will I the I, there is one that comes to mind for me for Sophie and I don't want to steal it from you so you should go before I do um but there is one where I laugh every time oh in my I was looking at other people's chapters so you go first <laughs> oh excellent um, it's, there's a part in one of the, like, it's just a background, like advertising thing. And I don't, I cannot tell you why I find this so funny. Um, let me see, got to find it. Do, do, do. Where is it? It's in that one of the parts where there's like advertising. Big sale, fashion barn. Can I, I will just say, say I just oh so I was just gonna really uh, give a shout out to this chicken purse that this person has in a, a rose's oh, yeah. background. I was like I could go for that chicken purse. Oh yeah, know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, there's so many great ones. I think it's like oh like one of the ads in the background is like yum yum dog, <laughs> or something like that. It's like very funny. Um, I find that very funny every time. Um, what else? What others are? Do people? I'm trying to think of other ones that come to mind for me. I mean, the first panel has like a blitz of advertising in it. And one of the ones that I'm the proudest of is one that's like, it's a fries and hot dog, a fries and burger. And like, it looks, it's supposed to be McDonald's, even though it doesn't have McDonald's on it. It just says, and the words are, I'm consuming it. That's the one. That's the one <laughs> I was trying to find. It just, I'm consuming it. <laughs> I find that so funny. That is, that is literally the one I was trying to find. <laughs> Yeah, I had a lot of fun with this. And I was like, you know, the and then there's like the scene where she steps into um, this like camera octagon kind of thing that captured this like a motion capture type thing. And there's this this great movie called um, Oh, shoot, what's the name? Uh, the actress's name at the Congress. Same oh, name? yeah, it's got Robin Wright from the Princess Bride. I've heard yes, Robin Wright. Robin Wright at the Congress. I believe that's the title of it. And it's like a very bizarre movie where it's about her. Um, and she's like, an, you know, she is playing herself and she's an aging superstar and they want to capture her entire image. Um, and so then they can like use it and like continue to like do films and stuff with her. Um, and there's like this weird, they're talking about like, well, we want to capture it before you get too old and like, um, and there's this great scene of her in the middle of this and they're just like yelling at her to like make expressions. Uh, and so I was thinking about that a lot for the scene. And I, and I think like, you know, this stuff is like not very far off. Like nothing that is in here is like that implausible now. They have these motion capture 3D things uh, that you can go into and like there, I, I get press releases. Let me tell you about the press releases that I get <laughs> about like technology. Um, but one of them is like that and you go in and what they want, they give you is like you go in with your like one year old and you film this like whole scene and then like you do it every year and then you can turn on your VR goggles and like 
go back into like when your kid was one and you could like interact with them in like a 3D VR kind of way. Ooh, uh, don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's a thing you can do now um, for a small sum of money, large sum of money. Um, so yeah, if you, anyone, if that sounds good to anybody, I can uh, hook you up uh, I, <laughs> with the company that does that. Um, Amelia Blue, do you Why? have favorite Easter eggs in there? Um, to, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Amelia. Oh, sure. Um, so I think I can speak for all of us in that any cartoonist loves to include visual gags in the backgrounds. Like you, there's so much real estate on the page to tell little stories. Uh, so I am also very fond of the two ladies on vacation in the old city that you can dive it as a excursion, um, <laughs> taking their little photos and stuff. Um, and I'm actually going to whip out my inks because I know that the mm. pages themselves, uh, they're, they're too nice. They're too glossy and they wouldn't <laughs> be able to come up yet. But in um, the Piazza San Marco, one of the fun things that I forgot to mention before is in a biosphere underwater, if it's large enough, according to your research, it would actually create its own microclimate. So you would have things like clouds and rain and precipitation. So I was trying to show like a bunch of the tourists who are like, you know, buying their overpriced umbrellas and being like, is it dripping? Is it raining? And there's a proposal mm. happening. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. So it is, it's like a Where's Waldo of what's going on back there. It's always fun to be rereading is worth it. That's so fun. I don't, I didn't even notice the proposal. That's so cute. <laughs> I love that. I also really liked um, all the languages that you included in the tourist center and they're just like things that really made it feel very real and like all of yeah. the little characters like the other people are in the decompression chamber and the girl who like uh, is at the check-in counter or whatever um, with I just remember she has cool hair but oh, I was <laughs> like <laughs> like the whole thing felt very real and I think this is actually a thing that both of your comics share is like the main driver the main driver of the story isn't really like the um the sci-fi concept that it explores it's the setting for like an emotional story and it's just like really um both of the, these stories are really great uh examples of like speculative fiction at its best which is like this is what I particularly love like not hard sci-fi, but stories that really, like like Blue said, explore the sociological like implications and things of that. So, you know, you get like you get the setting and the science, but it's kind of like almost a background to like what is happening between the characters. Mm -hmm. On the I I sent um there's a a scene where they're sort of like in the sort of dive the old city departures and there's some Chinese characters and I sent that to a friend of mine who's um was. Is from China and just to be like does this is this kind yeah. of like just to make sure and I didn't give her any context and I realized later like because like she's like this makes sense except like I don't understand what this is <laughs> <Why>? <laughs> like, just, like, these characters are correct but also what is going on like, she, like, <laughs> I was like oh yeah yeah it's a comic it doesn't like you know. uh it was very it was very fun <laughs> blue um, well, I was reminded, uh, based on your, uh, your Zoom background, a uh, fun conversation I had with Ziad, which I am very, I love food scenes in my comics. A friend of mine razzed me once by saying that my like brand as a storyteller is emotional eating, but I had a conversation with Ziad about like, what would be like a spread? Like what, what kind of foods would be on a spread? in a table in like a like a Tunisian family and he was like I was looking at the email right now to check but he was like oh spaghetti <laughs> he's like yeah a big you know that classic Tunisia Tunisian like, food yeah he was like no spaghetti with red sauce and beef in his email that I'm reading right now he's like yeah that's a big one I'll throw some spaghetti in there and I'm like all right I was just, I was not expecting it at all but like to his credit he drew some very appealing looking spaghetti like mm -hmm. I've seen him like draw Anything, fish. Right. Like he's drawn some really, really tasty fish. So I'm glad he put some in there too. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, this no, is actually one laughed. of my favorite panels. I love just like, it just feels so like, there's something about like the colors and the riches and the tablecloth and like, mm -hmm. just like all of it. It like, isn't super like realistic, but it feels right. Like you're like, yes, that is, 
that is what that would look like and you can yeah. like smell it almost you know it is in so that, like, hard to nail in comics like it is is such a fine line between it looking like gorgeous and incredibly appetizing and just like not landing at all and yeah it's really hard to get right I think he got it super right yeah, no, it's it's a it's a beautiful scene. And I love just like how much of that the family comes around food and they have this whole conversation. And then I also love the slideshow, the little cute slideshow in the, yeah. in the there's um, um so I want to ask some bigger picture questions. Um and I'm gonna I made zoom backgrounds for all of the various uh chapters. So I'm gonna change to one that we haven't even talked about and I'll just leave you in mystery as to what the episode is. How about this one? Okay. Um uh so um, we worked on this book, all of us, kind of like right before the pandemic really like took off in the United States. Um, I think I was looking back at my emails and like, you know, final stuff was due from you folks, like really look right before it got bad uh, in the US. Um, and, you know, as I've been doing some press for the book, people keep asking me like, have your thoughts changed at all? Was it weird trying to talk about the future at a time when like, the present is so um, precarious for so many people. Um, and, you know, I have my answer to that, which I'll, I'll give, but I'm curious how you all, you know, having thought about the future for this book, like, has anything, have you changed the way you think about the future over the past year since we sort of, the other weird thing about books is you like finish it and then you don't see it for a year because like, as it gets printed and stuff. Um, has anything changed, like, has anything changed for you all about the way you think about the future? Hmm. In general, or like as it pertains to our stories? I think either one I'm interested in. Well, I'll, I'll say for my story, like, I think that I, after people having a time when people are spending so much time in isolation, I see more of the value for um, the potential for the, the technology that is in my chapter where you have like virtual pop stars or virtual presences um, AIs, that sort of things, like, you know, people, uh, a lot of people were just so alone, and we have Zoom, but there's just, it's not the same as someone being present, so the idea of having, like, someone be virtually present with you, like, you, they look, you know, they look like they're physically sitting on their furniture, maybe you can't touch them or something, or you have, like, a lot of, like, you know, it broke my heart to think of, like, especially elderly people dying alone in hospitals or just like not having visitors because of being everything being shut down. I mean, just having the capacity to have like, maybe not a real person, but just like an AI presence who is in the room, like for them to talk to, like would be enormously valuable. Like we have like a really crappy version of that, which is like, there's like stuffed animals that will like purr or whatever that they sometimes give like elderly people of dementia or something as companions so they don't feel so alone and they can't take care of a cat. Oh, it's just making me so sad to think about it. But, um, but so I think that there is like enormous potential for like almost treating loneliness um, with this kind of technology that brings people into a space or creates virtual people, which, you know, I suppose may, may, some people may seem dystopian, but it, like, is that better than someone being alone? I don't think so. I mean, is someone alone being better than that? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. I was working on an episode of um, Flash Forward recently about touch and sort of like the importance of touch in the world. And um, Julia, who's the producer on the show, found this incredibly distressing image of like people filling up uh, like gloves uh -huh. with water. I don't know, do you see that? Where it was like, so it feels yeah. like someone's holding your hand, but it's like not. The hand, is it the touch. hand of God? Is yeah, it's called the yeah. end of God. And I just was like, that was one where I was like, I'm going to go have to take a walk now. Like, I don't, I need to like take a break. <laughs> like this is, because it is like where, you know, you can't be around people in the same way. Um, and like, this is lovely, but it would be nice if we could all be in the same room <laughs> like, yeah, um, and actually see each other. For anyone that's unfamiliar, they would take like two latex gloves and fill them with warm water and then tie the fingers and then put the person's hand inside the two gloves so it felt like their hand was being held yeah because <laughs> you like can't ha yeah yeah because you got... can't have visitors like yeah oh that's bleak it's very uh -huh. dark yeah this is yeah the world well, like, we live in <laughs> right right well people often will say like oh there are a lot of sad things in the book and I'm like 
the world is kind of sad right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do think that there's like a balance, right? Some chapters are very bleak and some chapters have, in, even in things where we're talking about things, like Venice being underwater because it's flooded by climate change isn't like a happy future, right? Like that's not like, <laughs> no one's like, woohoo, like yay. Um, but like there is, there's moments of, and I think the thing that I think a lot about for Flash Forward and I, I think every comic does is like, finding even in the dark stuff finding the places where humans are like weird and do stuff in the margins and kind of like figure it out and help each other and like go on dates and do you know do things yeah. even when the world around them kind of like sucks um and that has been I think we've seen that even in the pandemic right where people find ways to kind of connect and find ways to do that absolutely yeah um I might need your help on this Rose because uh, I'm trying to remember the exact number I put in my script but like early in my story i decided i would have like a throwaway like conversation happening in the background that referred to like paid leave like uh like parental leave and i remember i wrote a number that to me as an american was absurdly big and uh, i'm curious if you could track down the number but i feel like I I, I'm, I'm thinking about that now because I feel like something that I kept hearing about during like 2020 over and over again is the sheer imbalance that comes with like being a working parent if you're like a woman versus a man. And it's also like how that trickles down into like who keeps their jobs or not and like what people are expected to do. So I feel like I, something that was just kind of like a ha ha funny that I put in my script is like, became oddly pertinent again and I'm kind of wondering if the 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 you know the fallout of everything that came with the quarantine and like everything that's come from COVID I wonder if like radicalizing people to become like more insistent on like a humane paid leave kind of like system or a like healthcare system like I'm very curious like what will happen with that because i feel like there's 20 more weeks than yeah, ever. yeah 20 time? weeks oh. is what's in the um god even now that feels so, I know. so small <laughs> i know i know it's like you can have a little leave as a treat <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, um, um, yeah well i mean I have no, have leave. no guaranteed yeah no guaranteed paid leave right so nope other yeah. countries that that's wild um and yeah we have seen i mean people have you know the thing about the pandemic is that, you know, so many of the things that are in the book, all of the sort of things that we are, are things that we've seen in the pandemic because they were there before the coronavirus, right? Like the virus itself is novel. Income inequality is not, right? Healthcare disparities are not. Like all of these things that we're seeing kind of like come to the fore, you know, the disparities in, in sort of like domestic work and whose labor is valued, like, the coronavirus didn't invent that. Like that was there. And then there was like sort of this, this sort of like problem. Hello, kitty. <laughs> um, important visitor, uh, a very yes. important visitor. Special <laughs> guest. Yeah, <laughs> guest star, Chris. Guest star, I know, we are lucky. Oh um, okay, so we have like a little bit, and we're gonna wrap up soon. Um, uh, there are two questions in the Q&A that we'll do kind of quickly and then I want to make sure you folks have time to like plug your work like all the places people can find you oh my goodness so cute <laughs> um, so Francie hi Francie uh, says um, which features feel the most likely in the book and which ones feel the least likely in the book um, and I'm trying to kind of it, at one point and you know Sophie and I and Matt and I had long conversations about like how to order the book like what um, order to put it in and we had actually talked at one point about doing like most likely to least likely um sort of as the order it didn't end up being that way it's kind of a bit of a sort of like smattering we also talked about like near future to far future or like dark to light so you feel like you're coming out the other side you know like in the at the end of the book um uh and so I think that you know it as it stands now they're not in that order but we did kind of have some conversations around like which ones of these feel like, yes, this is going to happen. And which ones of these are like, sort of like, totally out there in, in the in in the sort of like weirdo land. The background that I have currently is from Box Brown's chapter about everyone carrying a lie detector around all the time, which feels highly unlikely to me, yeah. <laughs> um, but very fun to think about. Um, not, not least because lie detectors just don't work. So like, you know, there's that piece of it. Um, I hope the gender chapter, that's the one I'm the most like, 
hopeful to be true, right? Like that's one where people are like, which one do you want to come true? I'm like, that's the one, <laughs> blues chapter. Um, I also feel like um, Ben Passmore's uh, Welcome to Tomorrowville, which is about a smart city type environment is like, you know, I, I, I don't, like, I think it's probably more likely that you'll see like smaller spots of it than it being applied like universally. But the idea of like a technology surveillance society that kind of like tracks you all over and it's like framed as like, you know, it's basically like uh, the government is a Google campus. Like mm -hmm. that's the concept. And I, I think that seems very likely and, um, and not a little scary. Today's yeah. episode of Flash Forward that came out is about that chapter and about smart cities. So if you are interested in learning about smart cities and how they work or don't work, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent segue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones. I uh, think similarly, what? Sophie's has a chance of existing at some point in the future um, yeah. in some form or another. I think that we'll all have our own Hatsune Miku's. <laughs> yeah, I agree. The ones that I felt like the most plausible are ones where I feel like I already see it in microcosm in like some yeah. community or some place or another. Like that's how I feel about my stories. I feel like stories like that are already out there. I just like gave them better health insurance. Like I feel like, you know, there are like microcosms of like cultures or like campuses or things where like these are trying to happen or get a foothold and it's kind of just a matter of how much they take off that she will show how universal they become yeah and but like i don't know if, if venice is gonna you know <laughs> be saved in some way and reinvented but it is an unfortunate reality that climate change is happening and coastal erosion is happening um yeah. so that's i mean in a way i guess it's like which are the ones that seem the least probable? Because like, I think a lot of them do seem like scenarios that you could see happen. Whereas like somebody like, um, like Sophia Foster Nomino's like animal magnetism, which is about like a society where animals have like rights that are more towards what you would see in a, in a human. Um, like technologically we could do that tomorrow, but is mm -hmm. it going to happen? No. <laughs> <laughs> not at all yeah, yeah that's a good point like something like that it's just in a cultural mindset that needs to change like all the infrastructure is theoretically there right yeah. right people ask me sometimes like what are the hardest versions of the future to predict and it's always cultural stuff because like who can say like i mean you can predict any technology and be like this thing this thing exists and then it does that and like mm -hmm. yay but anytime you're trying to like shift big cultural norms that's like they move, they often feel like kind of the, like, what is it, the iceberg that starts to like slowly cave where it's like just a little bit and then all of a sudden, and that sort of like mm -hmm. feels like kind of often how it ends up going. Um, mm -hmm. And it's hard to say like when that's gonna happen. Um, Jess's question is around the amount of research for these chapters, like do folks feel like this will inform future projects or when you like start a new thing or you just like blank document, like forget everything I've ever done before. <laughs> you know, like, um, and for me, it's impossible to, not be always thinking about past stuff, even if it's not directly relevant. Like there's always ideas in there that like, and I will absolutely be like stealing inspiration from these artists forever, I'm sure. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful that um, my memory is weird, but long. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm pretty thankful that this story was basically an excuse for me to stay on my BS. Like I always like, like these are already themes that I love exploring constantly. So, you know, getting paid for the privilege is always great. Um, I, yeah, no, I don't know. I think I'm sure like the like research that I did might pop up in something like that again, but yeah, I wasn't really going very far out of my wheelhouse for this one. I'll throw some bugs in there somehow. And then like, yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I should have given them like bug donuts to eat or something that really would have completed the blue Delaquani Venn diagram. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, you get bingo somehow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, so this was actually um, a departure from my usual wheelhouse in that I tend to focus on historical stories. 
Um, I was a history major. I, I mean, they all involved the ocean in some way. So like Blue said, it was a privilege and a pleasure <laughs> to be paid to read about it and draw it. Um, but I, I always do a lot of research into like, you know, what time period is it? What kind of clothing would people be wearing? What kind of hairstyles and what's going on that would involve like world political dynamics that would infer how people act about stuff. So it was wonderful actually having that whole dossier handed to me with all the research done and I just had to distill what you had already done, Rose. <laughs> <laughs> I love research. I will go down rabbit holes all day because I just like cannot get enough of it. Mm -hmm. um, so let's wrap up and I want to give folks a space to like talk about where to find you. So you can find Flash Forward, flashforwardpod.com, the book, there are links to all that stuff in the um, chat there if you haven't seen it. But um, let's do just like, where can folks find your work, like books that they can buy, all that good stuff. Uh, Sophie, you wanna go first? Sure, yeah. Um, I, I have a, if you're interested in like checking out my work, I have a bunch of my shorter comics up on my website, which is redinkradio.com. Oh, it's the links up. So check the chat. Um, and uh, so that's where a bunch of my short comics are. Um, House of Women and The Oven, Embarrassment of Witches uh, are sold wherever books are sold, like theoretically. Um, and I also have a Patreon, which is where my the most recent stuff that I've been working on is posted. So I've, in the past year, I've been doing a lot of actually prose science fiction writing and I've been posting short stories on my Patreon. So if you're interested in reading a bunch of fiction by moi that has not been published anywhere else at present, <laughs> yes. uh, check out my Patreon, uh, which is at uh, patreon.com backslash Sophie Goldstein. Uh, so that's where you can find me. Yay, um, Amelia. Uh, so my website was just posted in the chat as well. It is ameliaonorato.com. Um, I do all the coding myself, so it's not the best. I am much more <laughs> of a cartoonist than I am a web designer. Um, but it links to my social media. I'm active on Twitter. Um, I post a lot of my food pictures of food that I make on Instagram, as well as cat pictures. Um, and it also has links to uh, ancient tumblers where you can read most of my mini comics for free. So, and I, I have a modest remember Tumblr. online store. Remember Tumblr? <laughs> Blue. Um, you can find uh, the link to my professional website in the chat at bluedeliquanti.com. Um, I have a comic that uh, ran for eight years called Oh Human Star at O humanstar.com. Um, I also have a Patreon. All of that is centrally located at bluedeliquanti.com. So you can find all of my gender future bug comics in one central conveniently located place. Um, I highly recommend everyone check everyone's work out. Like truly, it's been uh, a, it's an incredible honor for me to work with these folks who are so, so smart and good at what they do. So please do check it out. You can Buy the Flash Forward book wherever books are sold, including Magic City, and also um, your local bookstore. If this is like, just please, please order from your local bookstore, um, not Amazon. Thank you. Support uh, local yeah. business. Yes, local businesses, great. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate everyone being here. Yeah. Um, and we will see you all on the internet. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.